Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with UNM historian and author David Correa, who is also managing editor of the online environmental report La Jicarita out of northern New Mexico. David has been active recently in organizing demonstrations and protests against a long history of heinous acts of police brutality in Albuquerque, especially the, the gratuitous use of lethal violence by the APD in the murder of James Boyd in the Sandia foothills last week. This is a terrible time in the history of our city. Thanks for coming to talk with us uh, about this new movement that's, uh, that's arisen in our town. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. In the last four years, Albuquerque has seen 37 shootings by police and 23 of them fatal. And those of us who follow such things know that this is a long, there's a long history of similar abuse in our city going back to at least the 1980s and probably far beyond that. Recently, the, the murder of James Boyd has triggered, if you will, a highly, highly vocalized citizen reaction. Um, I'd like to talk to you about that in great detail uh, in the time that we have. But first, I'd like to ask you your, your views about who is accountable for these acts, who is accountable for this climate of really gratuitous violence in our city. If the, if the question is who's accountable, the answer is nobody. Nobody's accountable. <laughs> nobody's accountable for the death of James Boyd. No one's accountable for the death of Alfred Redwine, Alan Gomez, um, you know, Jacob Michelin. No one is. And I think that uh, this has been the narrative by Mayor Barry and by Gordon Eden over the last couple of weeks is that they're going to start developing uh, means of accountability. And this has been the, uh, the thing that the DOJ has been talking about. How do we achieve these means of, of accountability? And there's no way to do it if we're continuing to talk about reforming APD. Uh, because uh, this has been a pattern, as you point out, that goes back a long time. It goes back to the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Um, there have been movements, and they're largely poor people's movements, against police brutality and police violence in Albuquerque in the 60s, in the 70s. Um, this, and it's not just Albuquerque. I've written about uh, struggles against police violence in Riariba County, in San Miguel County, in Albuquerque. It's all over. But there is something about APD that we have to talk about. You, as you point out, we're talking about 23 young men, m many of them homeless, many of them with mental illness, shot down in the streets over the last four years. And you called the death of James Boyd a murder. And I would say that he was, it was an execution. Um, you know, he was executed mm -hmm. and he was executed because he tried to lay his head down to go to bed. Everything that every one of us did that night, laid our head on our pillow to go to bed. When he tried it, it was a crime and he was killed for it. And so we have to start addressing, to, to really talk about accountability, we can't just talk about reforming APD. We have to decriminalize homelessness. We have to decriminalize mental illness. We have to realize that laws against vagrancy, laws against loitering, laws against panhandling are laws that eventually bring homeless people into confrontations with police, and those confrontations are often violent. And why was, James, why was James Boyd, as his friends call him, Abba? Why was Abba armed? Well, you know, he couldn't lock the door of his house when he went to bed that night. So when you're sleeping on the streets of Albuquerque, you have knives to protect yourself. Um, and he was, as you point out in your brilliant piece in Provincial Matters that you wrote this week, you know, he was protecting himself against uh, uh, this aggressive attack. And I think that the million people who have seen that video oh. on YouTube agree. And I think the anger that people are feeling is a different kind of anger than the frustration and the sadness and the fear that we felt in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 70s, when people confronted this pattern of police violence. Um, there have been periods in the 90s and 80s where the APD has killed more people in a shorter amount of time than they have right now. And each time we've hoped that reform measures will fix it. In the 90s, we created a police oversight commission and we hoped that it would resolve the problem, but they killed more people. In the 80s, we, we transformed training and raised standards for police, and we hoped that they'd stop killing people, but they didn't. Uh, and so we, we have to look very skeptically at any of these claims by Barry or by Eden that any of these reforms are going to make a difference, because if the past is a lesson, then the future will be the same. 
And I think it's, in, it's, it's, it's also very important because in the last few days, Barry has come out um, saying that he wants to collaborate with DOJ, saying that he wants DOJ monitoring of APD, that he wants, to, that he's, he's touting these reforms he's created. Let's just remember that in the two days after the video was released of James Boyd, Police Chief Gordon Eden called it justified even before investigating. And when directly asked by a reporter, if he if Barry still thought the APD was the best police department department in the country, he said yes without he hesitation. So these are not people interested in reforming APD. And they're certainly not people interested in doing the hard work of addressing the structural issues that make it inevitable that certain people are eventually going to have violent confrontations with police. They're not going to be people living up in the Northeast Heights. They're not going to be people living in wealthy communities on the West Side. They're going to be the poor. They're going to be young Chicano men, native men. They're often homeless. They're often um, suffering from mental illness. They've come. They've served tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. These are the people that are dying on our streets. So let me press this just a tiny bit about accountability. I mean. Uh, I thought your answer was exactly right. There is no accountability, but. When you put together the media, the DA, the mayor, the chief, the hierarchy, the city council, uh, the state attorney general, uh, you have the creation of a climate, of a culture, of a cloud, of a fog, of a, uh, of, uh, of a, um, a stink of denial uh, where nobody will take any kind of action, where the DA lets these people go, these cops, these shooters, go constantly, constantly, constantly. What? So if there's no way to reform it, do we have to simply wipe it out and start all over again? There, I think there's a difference between uh, real reform that's meaningful and the kind of reform that they've been peddling for, for decades. Good. And, and, and of course, that's not the whole thing, right? We have to address these structural issues. But, but here would be real reform. Let, let's, let's confront this for a second, okay? Let's really look at this question of accountability and who should be accountable. First, um, as we know by now, uh, DA Kerry Brandenburg has gone out of her way to avoid ever indicting a police officer involved in a shooting. And she's done that by creating these special grand juries that are almost designed by their very nature to both give the, give the appearance of an investigation while at the same time secretly and behind, and back, you know, and behind closed doors exonerate police officers. There has to be pressure on, on the DA, yeah. right? Um, let's consider the Attorney General, Gary King. Um, Gary King is actually the chairman of the board of the New Mexico Law Enforcement Training Academy. Um, he alone he alone could pull the certificates that every police officer needs to serve as an officer in the state of New Mexico. He could do it as attorney general, and he could do it as the, as the, the chairman of that board. And he has not done anything, and there is no pressure on him. We need to transform that. Let's consider actual community oversight of police. Um, if you talk to anybody who claims to know how community oversight should operate, the first thing they'll tell you is, well, communities just simply cannot discipline the police. The, the authority to discipline, to hire and fire the police has to exist in the, in the office of the chief. Um, and, the, what the, and they'll point to the rest of the country and, and re remind us that there are no community police oversight boards that have that authority. And we should remind them that those boards did have that authority in the progressive era. And it was the intense effort by police to continually define their jobs as something different, as not somehow an embedded social institution in the fabric of society, but somehow apart from it, somehow having to do nothing, having nothing to do with the way that our communities operate, and that they have some sort of specialized knowledge. And our Police Oversight Commission here buys into that. And the Police Oversight Task Force recommendations to reform it are good, but don't go far enough. And they even include language that requires anyone who wants to sit on the Police Oversight Task Force or the, the Police Oversight Commission to train as a police officer. I think what we should be talking about is training police not to be police officers. 
putting them in social service agencies, working in street outreach without guns and without badges, and recognizing what it means to be homeless and mentally ill in the streets of Albuquerque. Because the only time they see it is when they're sent with their AK-47s and their, and their repeat offender uh, units and the SWATs and the dogs, and that's when they confront the homeless, and that's when they confront the mental illness. We can't, we cannot allow police oversight to be only, to only exist in an advisory capacity. We have to seize control of the police, and the only way we can seize control of the police is if we have binding community oversight. Don't believe the police when they say they have some sort of specialized knowledge that only they can interpret, that only the police can police the police. I will remind you that the police are a social institution like all the rest of our social institutions. I work at the University of New Mexico, and the Board of Regents has final say on who gets to have a job at the University of New Mexico as a professor. And the board, the chairman of the Board of Regents is John Chalmers, who owns a car dealership. Now I ask you, what is owning a car dealership how does owning a car dealership give him any expertise on what I do for a living? The reason is because he's a member of the community and we've decided that that's how we want to operate, that we want to have a rotating board of regions, people drawn from the community who decide what's important. As, are the people that work at UNM doing things that serve our community? And only the community can decide that. And likewise, only we can decide, do the police serve our community or are they killing the us? And until we have that, no reform will matter. Until we have binding community oversight of police, it won't matter. Until Gary King does his job, none of this will matter. Until Kerry Brandenburg, who hopefully will not be the DA very much longer, and we get another DA in there, starts doing their job, none of this will matter. And I think those are the, I think that's the kind of accountability that they're truly scared of. And it's precisely why none of the reforms have ever included that. So as we... As we remember uh, the old police cars, and some of them uh, still do, you know, they say, in step with our community. And now the new police cars are out there, you know, with their, with their shaded glass and their, and their uh, RoboCop uh, image. I think, um, obviously, this police force has been out of step with its community for a very long time. The community response to, to that video of the murder of James, the execution of James Boyd, uh, has been, I think, has caught everybody off guard. I think it particularly caught the mayor and the council off guard, the mayor and the council, the do-nothing mayor and the non-existent council off guard. Uh, who are these protesters? What organizations do they belong to? What kinds, what's, what's their thinking? Uh, and later on I want to ask you about what happened at, the, at, that, at that last confrontation, but that's, but that's for another moment. Could you describe a broad overview of what's going on. Yeah, I, sure. I think that um, I think it it does require really trying to understand what's happening in response after the execution of James Boyd. Um, you know, I think the the, the first um, <clears throat> the first march uh, on on APD on Monday, I believe it was March twenty fifth. Mm. Um, a thousand people marched on APD, and we. Uh, occupied the front doors and the front steps of APD. And that was a march that was organized by a lot of community organizations and activists who've been working on this issue for a long time. Um, a, a lot of people coming together, the Answer Coalition, Peace and Justice Center, um, the Martin Luther King Center, a lot of people that have been working on this for a long time that included families of victims of APD violence organized that. And it brought out a really diverse group of people. Um, you know, there were people from, from all over the city that came to that. And the point of that march was to really start um, uh, trying to produce a mass movement to put unbearable pressure on the city and the police department. And, and I think that that got the attention of the city, but it wasn't until uh, the anonymous uh, anonymous emerges and starts calling for protests um, because it was the spontaneity and the rage of that march that, that I think um, it wasn't the size of the march it was the spontaneity and the rage of the protesters there that really um, frightened uh, a lot of people but particularly I think the the mayor the, the police chief and and it and it also opened up this dialogue beyond the borders of our city, and so and it's become an, a national, and even international 
story. And, and let's remember, by the way, um, the, the first efforts of the mayor to call the protesters at that, at that march in which they, um, in which they momentarily seized the interstate, right, and marched from downtown to up to, to Knob Hill and back to downtown. Um, this was a peaceful march. These were angry young people, um, uh, angered by what they saw in the video uh, when James Boyd was executed, and they, and they came out into the streets to find answers. And their and their questions they asked were impolite questions, and they were uncivil questions, and rightly the, and rightly so. Um, and they were peaceful, and there was no vandalism, despite what the city was saying, and there was there was no violence, despite what the city was saying. And and if you see the images and watch the videos of that march, what you see is the militarization of our police force. You see police in riot gear. You see military equipped units that I was trying to explain to people that day, that's not the National Guard, that's actually APD, right? They had tanks and urban assault vehicles. They were tear gassing people that were, you know, they were hunting people in the crowd to arrest them and arrested six people that night. So, you know, and I think it was, it was really the, the way in which that, that crowd was a much different crowd. It was an angrier crowd than the one on the previous march. And then yesterday's candlelight vigil was, an, was a different crowd. I mean, these are these are different communities mm. come, rising up mm. and putting pressure on the city. And this was a crowd that doesn't know what to think about APD. And these were people that candlelight vigil that were grieving James Boyd's death and didn't know what to do. And starting to recognize maybe this has to something to do with mental illness. And maybe maybe mental illness is somehow linked to police violence. And they had never maybe considered that possibility before. And now they were doing that. And in a, in a sense, I think this, this doesn't have to radicalize people for us to actually make a difference here, but this has to force us to start making some uncomfortable connections that not a lot of people have made in the past. The families of APD victims have made these connections in the past. The people have been harassed and have experienced violence with police have made these connections. But suddenly we're all forced to make the connections between poverty, mental illness, policing, and violence. And those are really uncomfortable connections and they're real and the material effects of those are people's deaths. Chances are, it seems, it seems to me, that, um, that one of the ways uh, uh, the media will get into this, um, which they haven't done very well at all, and that's, I think that's an understatement, actually, um, is, to, is to play up the, uh, the economic consequences of, of this, of suddenly having, what is it, 780 BBC stations around the world uh, flashing that video over and over and over and over again. It may not be a Rodney King moment in Albuquerque, but it's becoming a, an oddly a Rodney King moment all, all over the rest of the world because we're simply not covering it as much as we should. Uh, so I guess in the realm of who's creating this, this culture and this context, I think the media is, is right there too. The mainstream, uh, I think, has just done nothing uh, t to talk about this. Is that your view too? This is that strange bedfellows moment when <laughs> complaining about the mainstream media is something the left and the right share, right? But I, 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 I think your point is well taken, and, and, it, and we have to address this. The, the, real, the real failure of, of our local media here has been not that they haven't covered police violence, because they've done it, right? The, 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 the Albuquerque Journal has covered it, um, I think much better than the TV news have covered it. The TV news, they just want to cover violence. but. And, and they don't care what that violence is, but but the Albuquerque Journal has 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 has, has chronicled over the last four years and even before this this pattern of police violence. The problem is they don't call it a pattern of police violence, and it's only when activists, family members of victims of APD, have started to raise their voices and demand something in response and demand accountability that that the idea of a pattern has even been something that that the media has been willing to acknowledge it's a pattern and and so if you're if you're if you're not paying attention and just reading your your daily paper um it's always just a, a a problem of a bad cop or a problem of bad training or bad leadership and we'll just take care once we get rid of those cops or raise those hiring standards or improve that training or get a better chief in here whew, all things will be better and then we'll forget about that and then all of a sudden there'll be another shooting and we'll say the same thing well look at those bad cops and then well, let's look at that training again is this really the chief we want? And over and over again. And that's the cycle we're in. And we have to hold the press accountable here to tell the story. It, the, and I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not a journalist. Um, I write. 
I chronicle these events. I consider myself an independent journalist, but I don't have an editor who, who forces me to tell a story a particular way. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem here is the way in which the story is always told as an isolated incident of violence, not connected to a set of political issues, structural issues, legal problems, political, you know, it's always just a cop shot somebody. What strikes me oftentimes is that this is, uh, this is like basketball reporting. You know, the coach is bad, you know, you got a couple of bad players, let's, let's get them we'll switch it all up, then it'll all be fine. I mean, the parallels are really quite shocking, I think, and they're, and they're there. The, um, uh, uh, we hear that, that, that there was a large meeting at the Peace and Justice Center uh, that came up with a, a plan uh, with a short-range set of the goals and a long-range set of goals. Could you talk about that meeting and what happened there and what the results were? Um, yeah, a few nights ago... Um uh, a number of groups, uh, the, the the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice, Unoccupy Albuquerque, um, a group that I've been working with, Task Force for Public Safety, that includes families of victims of APD and local activists and community organizations, called what we, we call the meeting, uh, called the Community Forum on, on APD. And 175 people came out to the Peace and Justice Center, and we... We spent two and a half hours working through an agenda that began by letting people vent and debrief what had been happening over the last few few weeks. And, um, and then we moved into really working through these demands. Uh, and, and originally, um, I was p part of this task force that a week ago, just after the video was released of James Boyd, um, the families of victims of APT were at this meeting and they, they were the ones that were just done with reform and they were done with talking and they wanted real meaningful changes and they wanted these to be demands. And they were demands that, that um, I think really addressed the full range of issues here, demands that try to address the particular problems that APD um, put APD in receivership and have the DOJ temporarily mm -hmm. take over. Um, this is a demand that the mayor has now said he's a, he'll agree to some part of that, some sort of his version of that, which, of course, we must reject. Um, but it also, there were a series of demands about decriminalizing homelessness, um, you know, demands that try to get at the structural issues yeah. that, that, you know, these family members know firsthand through the tragedy that's happened in their own lives. Um, and we worked through those for about 45 minutes, and I think most of the people in attendance, and, and again, we had a lot of people, really wanted to focus right away on things that we could accomplish immediately, things we could do right now, um, we could demand right now. And so those, those demands were shortened, and they included things like um, a demand for the police to release all lapel and helmet cam videos from every police shooting in the last four years. Now, it's, it's remarkable that we have to demand this. Yes. <laughs> First of all, um, two years ago when the city spent $60,000, um, I'm probably wrong at the, the amount, but they spent a lot of money buying these lapel and cam videos. And at the time, they touted it as one of their reform measures, that we're going to put these lapel videos and these cam videos on every officer at every confrontation. So, we'll, so they'll be held accountable. And we've requested through New Mexico uh, Public Records Acts Every one of these, uh, in New Mexico Compass just recently filed that request. But Silvio D'Angela, a local community activist, has been filing these requests for years, and they're always ignored. And every now and then, one will surface, and every now and then re they'll release one. And it always produces this outrage, yeah. right? Because they're videos that show not just James Boyd's execution, but show police officers tasering people and then chest bump bumping and high-fiving as lifeless bodies lay on the ground, or kicking people and shooting people. And that's what happens. Um, that's one of the demands, and, and, and I think that um, any reform has to include those videos no longer being in the control of APD. They shouldn't have access to those videos. A binding community oversight Absolutely. should control those videos Absolutely. and always release those videos. Um, we, you know, one of the demands was to indict all, all um, of the shooter cops, as they put it, and again, you know, these are these are sort of, I guess, in a, in a way, uh, sort of uh, regulative ideals. <laughs> this is the world we want to see. We want to we want to we, we want to live in a world without police violence. But until we get there, 
we want them hold, held accountable legally, right? Because right now there's just, there's two legal systems. There's one for everyone else and there's, mm. and there's one for cops. Yeah. Actually, there's three, right? There's one for the rich, there's one for the poor, and there's one for the cops. And the cops and the rich have a similar one. And, and the poor get harassed. So, so, you know, these are the kinds of demands that came out of it. And then we ended with next steps in that meeting. And the next steps were really about, all right, how do we sustain this movement and make sure that we're putting unbearable pressure on the city? Um, because right now, you know, I think that Mayor Barry and Gordon Eden, I think they think they have some wiggle room. And every day there's another press release. And every day there's another uh, statement from Barry saying he's, he's come to this conclusion. And he's, he's, he recognized this reform is necessary. And sometimes those press releases, sometimes those interviews with press appear to be coming from underground bunkers. And, and Gordon Eden hasn't really appeared much in public ever since that's, that stupid statement he made about it, a justified shooting. Um, they're, they're, they're frightened, I think, for their political lives, and they should be. Yeah. And, and I think that um, one thing that, that this movement needs to make clear is either um, we, they, get out of the way and allow us to make uh, real changes to the way that policing happens in the city. And if they won't, then we're going to make that happen. And that's going to be in the streets, and that's going to be in the ballot box, and that's going to be in the courts. And that's, and that's the movement that they have that they're, that's confronting them. And, and I think it's, it's because of that international media coverage, and it's because of people willing to get into the street, right? And it's, be, it's because of people who wouldn't usually come out yeah. to a meeting, wouldn't usually come out to a, to a protest, wouldn't usually come out to a vigil, are coming out. And every day, they're forced to see that movement growing. And that's the only way I think we can make real change here. In the old days of, of Viet, any Vietnam war protests, uh, we were always taught not to be on the outsides, uh, but, to tr but, but to try and get on the inside of the crowds so we wouldn't be whacked on the head and other things. Um, it seems pretty clear that there's uh, now, there's some old sort of riot patterns happening now. There are agent provocateurs uh, who are uh, uh, b becoming the causes, the alleged causes of police violence and other things. Could you talk about the actual protests themselves and what one ought to be aware of and what one ought to be looking for? Yeah, I think that's... It, it, I think it's important to remember that there will always be undercover police officers at community meetings about police violence. And, and, and when we were organizing the community meeting that drew out 170 people, um, you know, we were reminded by people who knew that this is what happened in 2003 when people in, in Albuquerque were organizing against the war in Afghanistan. Um, this is documented, right, that, that the New Mexico State Police, Albuquerque Police Department were placing undercover officers in, in meetings to try to, f to find out what people were planning, to find out what they were doing. And, and so and we reminded people of that at the meeting at the Peace and Justice Center. And we have to assume that there will also be instigators and provocateurs at, me at, at protests, like this person who brought an AK-47 <laughs> to the protest. This, 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 this person was either... Um, a provocateur, right? Or someone that we really have to, we have to pay attention to, we have to worry about, we yeah. have to, we have to make sure we're de-escalating those sorts of moments, those moments. Yeah. And I, and I think importantly, and the reason why we told people at the community meeting that there might be undercover officers here observing is because the city, the police in particular, uh, they don't make a distinction between violence like, and, and statements of violence, right? And people are angry and they're saying things like, I want to take it to the street. And, and so we have to remind them, be careful what you say, yeah. because later they'll use that against you when they arrest you at a protest. Yeah. And they'll say you had, you had intention to do, to do violence. And, uh, and this is, these, are, these are real, this is not paranoia. This is just, we have to be realized that this is the, this is the way they operate, that, that what they do um, is not violence because it's state sponsored. So they're killing of, of Abba, they're killing of Alfred Redwine and all the other young men. That's not violence. That's just doing their job. But 60 kids climbing, I mean, young people, young, mostly young people, um, swarming the APD substation and one of them spray painting fuck APD on there, that's violence? That's violence. That's what they want to tell us. 
Um, and so I think that that comparison no longer holds. The absurdity of that comparison, and not just the absurdity, um, but you know, it's it's a it's a profanity more than what I just said. <laughs> it's a profanity to say that what those protesters did was violence and what the police did was just their job. Well, I very carefully walked up and down the streets where uh, the protesters were looking for broken windows, cracked windows, or anything. I saw none. Um, I remember um, these days, uh, you know, all of these things, they kind of, they kind of come together but, um, over the many years. But the police know that they've got a free ride. They know they have a DA who's on their side. They know they have an attorney general who won't do anything. They know that they are karmically disengaged somehow. Uh, and until that happens, we all have to be very careful. And I really think that's important, to be very careful that we don't get hurt. Thank you, David, so much for being here with us. It's been, a, it's been an eye-opener as usual, and uh, what a terrible, terrible thing that we have to be talking about this at all. You're welcome, and, and thank you for covering this issue.